Um, the, uh, something to do with how motors start was invented here. The pop pop top can was invented here. Ice cubes <laughs> were invented here. <laughs> really? Uh, the pop then, top can? Yeah. Uh, and then of course the Wright brothers were here. So sure. uh, there's, there's that too. And while they didn't do their first flight here, this is where their bicycle shop was and where a lot of their, their uh, development work went on. So yeah. we have a big field here where they, uh, I guess I, I'm, not, I'm not really well versed in all the history, but um, they, I think they did some, some subsequent flights out there, but the, the wind conditions here were not really favorable for flying well, so. <laughs> right. That's why they went to, uh, to, to Kitty Hawk instead. I want to go to Kitty Hawk just to say I've been there. <laughs> that would be cool. <clears throat> Well, if you guys are tuning in uh, now, um, I see Richard Grace is logged on. Uh, Cameron Gillis is on with us, Mike Wiesner. Um, this is our first episode of Focus on Astrophotography. We got a great lineup here, and um, I'm excited. It's our first program. You know, if you're not careful, Scott and Molly and Chuck and Ross, this is going to be like a, a long session going forward. I think there's a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, we'll we're we're going to have to somehow manage this because it, it's an awesome thing. And we have some great people here. And I have uh, like one of those uh, hooks, you know, like they use on vaudeville stage. <laughs> and I just pull the, pull the guy <laughs> off. You know? we'll, have yeah, to, this, we'll have to focus our conversations on particular topics. Uh, I'll let you drive it. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. No, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of areas here and, uh, it's, it's, it's really fun. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful topic. And, um, yeah, it's, it's really great. And I think the, the, the thing I, I really like is I think we're at the cusp where, you know, we're, we're going to, all the stuff we're doing here is going to help uh, broaden the audience and get, more people, uh, more capable um, to, you know, take baby steps and take advantage of all the capabilities and learnings that have been made recently with all the new technologies and new chips, the, 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 the new mounts, uh, new, all these, the new enablers and, and filters and all these things to yeah. be able to really uh, mm -hmm. uh, have a lot of fun, you know, um, in the jur in journey. Uh, so it's going to be, it's going to be great. Yeah. That's awesome. That was yours, eh, Ross? Ross, you're a little bit quiet. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, you're, quiet. you're still a little bit quiet. Okay. Sounds like you're really far away from your microphone. Uh, make sure you've got the right microphone selected to be the one on your headphones. Yeah, sometimes it will go to your computer. Yeah. Yeah, right on, Molly. What happened to me earlier? <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. That's why we all got on a little bit early. Yeah. yeah. Sound check. <laughs> so, Molly, Ma Ma, you're. Uh, I, getting, I have a USB C. You're getting settled uh, there. When's your when your when your rig's going to be arriving? July six. Uh, July six. All I'm right. Going to my house. Yeah and all the rest of my furniture and my bed and everything. <laughs> Fantastic. So what are you going to set up first? <laughs> You're better. I'm going to sleep, <laughs> right? You all know the answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Who needs a bed? <laughs> you got imaging to do. Yeah. You got yeah. imaging to do. You're I, an astronomer. I have a temporary bed to sleep on, but I don't yeah. have a temporary telescope to image with. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hey, yeah, testing, okay. testing. Oh, very good. different. Yeah, You're good. That's way awesome. better. Mm -hmm. I finish uh, sharing this on. We have a little uh, featurette on uh, one of the cameras that's going to be used on the James Webb Space Telescope. So. Mary 
is one of the four instruments on board the James Webb Space Telescope. It's the one instrument on board the telescope that will be observing at mid-infrared wavelengths. Mm. The other instruments focus on the near-infrared part of the uh, spectrum. NERSPEC, NERCAM and the FGS, they work at wavelengths from about one to four or five microns. Now MIRI is unique on the James Webb because it operates at even longer wavelengths than that. So we start at five microns and we keep going out to 25, 30 microns. MIRI is actually a, quite a complex instrument. It has uh, several different observing modes uh, on board uh, in the instrument. So we have a camera, uh, that just takes uh, images in lots of different filters across the mid-infrared wavelength range. We also have spectroscopic modes, so we have uh, low-resolution spectroscopy and we also have a medium-resolution uh, integral field spectrograph. When you look in, inside our own galaxy, you can see dusty regions and there's things going on inside those clouds, inside the dust, that you can't see because dust is essentially opaque. If you move out to longer wavelengths, out into the infrared, the opacity, you know, the amount of light that is absorbed by that dust drops. And so we can see not just the surface, but into the, the heart of dusty region. So that means we can see to the center of our own galaxy more easily. We can see inside dusty regions where stars are being formed and see them, you know, see, see what's really going on when a star is formed in space. We're really going to be able to address a huge range of, uh, of science questions. MIRI is going to be able to probe uh, even further back into the history of the universe. It's going to be able to really study the atmospheres of planets around other stars and really be able to kind of search for the signatures of molecules in those atmospheres. Those are some, just a few of the highest kind of profile science goals that we hope to achieve with MIRI. James Webb. Yeah. Every time you give, uh, every time somebody asks when it's going to launch, it's delayed by another month. So. Another <laughs> month. That's right. <laughs> no, it's crazy. So don't ask. <laughs> well, it was delayed another year and another year and another year. And oh my gosh. It was delayed know. again, I heard. I, I don't know till when, but you know, pandemic problems. It'll be worth the wait, though. I it will be worth the wait. Yeah, yesterday, Scott, you shared something on the space telescope from the 1970s, it looked like, that film. Uh, yeah, it was it, actually, it, was... it actually came out, I think, 1981. Um, ah, okay. So, uh, but some of it might have been gathered, you know, actually shot or produced in the late 70s or something. You know, it was really cool. We had Carl Sagan on there, you know, and uh, um, and many other, uh, you know, wonderful uh scientists and researchers and stuff was really, uh, it was just, uh, it's fun for me to look at, to watch old uh, kind of what I now call vintage, you know. I, I, I have kind of, uh, uh, when I look back at movies like that or documentaries like that versus what's going on now with visualizations and stuff, wow, you know, we've come a long ways. So, um, but it was really cool to learn about the history of a, uh, what they were just calling space telescope, you know, so. But uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. This is our first episode of Focus on Astronomy, um, right? <laughs> and and we, have, uh, we have several astrophotographers. We got a few astrophotographers of our own um, uh, here on the screen. If I'm looking at it to my right is Tyler Bowman. We have uh, Chuck McEwen, uh, Molly Wakeling, who's been on many global star parties and a couple of special uh, videos that we've done. Uh, Ross Ferguson, who's now working here. Cameron Gillis, who uh, does cam, cam astronomy with us. Woo! You know, so <laughs> anyhow, um, uh, being it's our first time, uh, and although you may know uh, some of these people that are on our program today, uh, I'm gonna have them reintroduce themselves uh, talk about you know what drives them in astrophotography, how did they get started, uh, and share a few astrophotographs. And we're going to start off with Molly. So, all righty, um, yeah. So I'm Molly Wakeling, also known as Astrono Molly. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty proud of that one. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I've been doing astrophotography for uh, coming up on 
on s- six years now, <laughs> which oh. is insane. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, coming uh, this July uh, will be will be will mark my sixth year. So that's that's crazy. Um, and uh, uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen because I want to show you a picture of my telescopes. Sure. Yeah, a true veteran, especially with uh, six years being the last six years of development. That's that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been some huge leaps and bounds in that time, and it's really been with kind of the the oncoming of CMOS sensors sort of c- coming into fruition that into the astro market that has allowed beginners like myself to really get into it quickly, and plus having a lot of internet resources and all these computerized mounts and stuff like that. Uh, so this is my backyard rig uh, from when I was in California. I haven't set back up now that I've moved out to Ohio, but my Ohio setup will look more, will look pretty much like this, but I have much more sky open to me. I don't have as many trees and my backyard is much larger. So um, I'll have a little more space around. So here on the left is uh, my primary rig. This is a eight inch Schmidt cast grain from Celestron on a Paramount Mighty which mm-hmm. has been phenomenal. And I have a Prima Lucha Lab, a Sato Focuser, um, a Mead Focal Reducer, a ZWO filter wheel, and my ZWO 1600 monochrome camera, and astronomic LRGB filters, and Chroma H Alpha and O3. I was going to get their S2 filter recently, but their price has recently doubled because of uh, mm. pandemic things, I'm sure. So I'm going to hold off on that for a minute. Doubled. Yeah. Yes, doubled. I, I, I got the, the H alpha wow. and the oxygen three filters for seven fifty a piece and now they're thirteen 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 fifty, so almost doubled. <laughs> nice. Wow. One thing I noticed, Molly, just quickly on the Prima Lucha focuser, that's yeah. an in li- an inline that uh, Crafer type, right? Yes. Yeah. It's so that, uh, that way you don't have any mirror flop or anything like that. That's exactly right. Yeah. And that's, so I have awesome. the primary mirror set in one position. And then um, the focuser has two inches of travel, so it can handle a variety of, of configurations without me having to, to move the mirror around. Um, so there's there's That's less good. mirror flop because the mirror uh, I'm not I'm not refocusing the mirror itself, so kind of gravity falls it into place and it kind of sticks there. So excellent. Uh, I actually don't have a whole lot of mirror flop with this telescope to begin with. My 11 inch was was terrible, but my eight inch mm-hmm. is a lot a lot better. Yep. Uh, the center rig here is uh, my my secondary rig, which has my uh, wonderful, amazing Takahashi FSQ 106N. Uh, I recently wrote a review on it on the Astro Gear Today that'll be coming out in a couple of weeks. Here, um, it's on the Ioptron Sem 40, which is my newest mount. I just got it last, uh, I don't know, October, November, something like that. It's been really good so far, very lightweight, little workhorse of a mount. And I have a ZWO294 camera on here, a ZWO electronic focuser, and a Starlight Express filter wheel. And I have an astronomic light pollution filter, a luminance filter, and an Optolong L-Extreme, which is their duo narrowband filter. That, uh, I went with the Duo because the narrow band was much narrower, only three nanometers instead of uh, seven or 12. So um, I need that to cut through all my light pollution. And this third rig over here on the right is my science rig. So I do a lot of observing for the American Association of Variable Star Observers. And mm-hmm. I'm also an ambassador for, for, uh, for them. And I've been slowly kind of digging into exoplanet observing too, but I haven't had a whole lot of time dedicating to dedicate to learning how to process that data, seeing as I'm currently getting my PhD, <laughs> so it kind of limits my time. Um, this is a Newtonian uh, eight-inch F4 scope. It's a. Uh, it uh, was passed on to me from another uh, from another amateur astronomer in my astronomy club, and I have a QSI 583 here that was also passed on to me from an AAVSO member and it's sitting on a Celestron AVX, which I bought with my own money. So there you go. <laughs> oh. uh, the AVX, it leaves a lot to be desired, but for doing scientific observing, you actually don't need as long of exposure times or as good of tracking as you do for astrophotography, like pretty picture photography. So it gets the job done for objects that are at least up to about 14th magnitude 
if I want to go dimmer, I'm going to need longer exposures. So. <laughs> Are you focusing mainly on stellar objects with, with that uh, scientific? Yeah, so far I've just been doing, I've been doing variable stars um, so far. Uh, but I, I do want to branch out to some other exciting things uh, as I kind of get better at the process and um, maybe upgrade them out at some point. But yeah, I just do, I do a lot of uh, various periods of variable stars and just chuck my data at the database and other people download it and process it. Because while that would be also fun to do, I don't have to. <laughs> yeah. I am already months behind on just submitting the data, much less processing it. <laughs> so, yeah, I like um, how your your I like how your focuser is orientated in line with the axis, right? So that, yeah, so that keeps I've, the balance better. Yeah, that's what I've heard from other Newtonian imagers that it's better to have the camera on the bottom instead of on on the side or the top uh, for balance purposes. And uh, I have, I'm able to kind of, I have a, a counterweight on the back so that I can have the camera sitting far enough forward to not hit the mount. Well, not only does it help with balance, it's more for shift or focus or tilt as well. So you'll have a, an oblong stars on one side of the frame. So we always try to recommend people to put it either straight down, basically straight down to make it easier um, to eliminate the actual tilt issue, even though if there is no tilt, it's just the, the heaviness of the camera that causes the issue. People don't realize that. Interesting. That's a good point, Tyler. Excellent. Yeah. And I'm also jealous of your Takahashi. Yeah, I love my Takahashi. I bought it from my uncle when he upgraded to the newer model of the 106. And, uh, you know, I've got a nice uh, family discount for that one. So <laughs> uh, I really didn't think I would own a Takahashi until much later in my life when I had more money to throw around. But uh, it, it's every bit as awesome as, as they say it is. So I'm very happy to own it. Well, let me show you all a couple of pictures I've gotten. Um, so this is on the eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain with those chroma H alpha and O3 filters. This is the Dumbbell Nebula done on my monochrome camera. And this is from Bortle 7 Skies out in San Francisco Bay area, just north of, of Berkeley. And I was very excited to finally get some of this outer uh, outer ring here, which uh, which you don't ordinarily get. Uh, you really need to do narrow bands in order to get it, or have dark skies. Sometimes you can get it wide band with really dark skies. Is that H, nice. is that H two or O three? Which, which is that? Uh, so the the red I, I, this is an H O O combination. So the red is H alpha and the blue is O three, blue and yeah. green. And there is I did also have a fair bit of this in H alpha of the outer outer disk, but I couldn't quite get it to show up when I was processing. Uh, so I'll probably, you know, give this another go when I have uh, more skills and stuff like that. Great um, image. And very satisfying to, to catch that. Thank you. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> hang on. Give me one second to tell my neighbor I'm, I'm in a bit of a video call. <laughs> hey, I'm on right. <laughs> yeah. mm. This is, this is, this is, I was going to ask uh, Molly when she comes back to go her portal, she said portal seven. <laughs> my, my neighbor stopped by. Oh. Um, so, Molly, are you, you said you, you were in portal uh, seven skies before, but what, what's your new uh, sky condition? Also portal seven. <laughs> also, okay, okay, so it'll be the similar. That was the yeah. first thing she asked before she yeah. moved there. Is it Bortle 7? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, although it's yeah. easier here. And there's fewer clear nights, so it's going to be even harder. Um, but, you know, this kind of stuff gives me hope that I'll still be able to get some, some good imaging done because I was oh, yeah. so happy with all the detail that I was yes. able to Look get. at that. And you have, because you have a larger swath of the sky, you can keep on the same object for longer for periods. So. That is true. Yeah, that, that yeah. I will be able to do that, which is nice, um, which is good because I'll, I'll have to I'll have to take a larger chunk of the year to image things because we have so many cloudy nights here. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. I know what it's like. I'm in Seattle, so. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, oh man, how do you do anything? <laughs> yeah, tell me. But that's why actually I'm shifting to imaging because uh, you know every, every minute counts. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Molly, you have been on uh, many pr different programs and stuff uh, having to do with astrophotography. What is it that uh, you haven't really dived into? Uh, you haven't really shared with an audience yet about your astrophotography work? Um, well, one thing is I actually do planetary imaging too. I just don't show those as often because my deep sky images are, I think, uh, generally more exciting. Um, and uh, I still, I'm still kind of, I, I, I have not lived in a place that's had 
great atmosphere to be able to get mm -hmm. great images. Right. Plus, since I do um, mostly deep sky, it's a bit of a pain for me to remove the focal reducer to use the full focal length of my scope. And then also put on, I have a two and a half X uh, Barlow now from, from Botter and yeah. um, which should be better than the slush drum one that I had. Uh, because of the pain of interchanging parts, I have not done very good planetary imaging, but there's been a couple of nights where I've gotten very lucky and mm. have gotten some really phenomenal images. So I haven't, I haven't really talked as much on the planetary side of, of the stuff that I do. Mm -hmm. But I might have to do that sometime when we talk about yeah. planetary stuff here. <laughs> yeah, I think you have shown a couple though. I, I'm, you, I probably have, yeah. Yes, you have. Molly, cool. I just I love recently. This one. Yeah, Molly, I just imaged that one too, and I was going to show it, but uh, I'm not anymore. Oh. <laughs> yours, is, <laughs> yours is too good. <laughs> Irish, no, we Irish. want to see it. Yeah. This is not from the Bortle 7. This is from uh, Bortle 3.5 out at a dark sky site out, out outside Sacramento. I, I would go to a lot. Uh, so this is the Iris Nebula. This is one of the few times, one of the first times that I finally got that brownish color to show up in my dust, which was super exciting. This is oh, one weekend's beautiful. worth. I think it was one or two nights worth of data from um, this is on my Takahashi with my ZWO294 color camera and just a luminance filter. No, uh, uh, it's Bortle three and a half. The light pollution filter isn't quite as necessary. And I was really excited just to get some really nice detail and to really just to get that, that brown color of the dust was, was really exciting to me. It um, really gives you a three dimensional, you know, yes. view. This yeah. really gives you a depth of field and then really nice dynamic texture and dynamic range it's really really awesome thank you and that's what i've been that's been kind of my as i'm working my way up and getting better doing astrophotography processing getting that 3d effect is what i've been working on right i've learned some new techniques from the astro imaging channel and i finally subscribed to adam block's uh website to I, i've not made it through even a fraction of his videos yet, but um, uh, yeah, I got, I got to, I got to step up my game. I'm kind of using the same processing scheme for about the last year and a half. I need to learn some new techniques. So, uh, but yeah, that 3D effect is, is what I've been working on learning how to do now a little more. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. That, that print, printed up big on that uh, Canon printer would look awesome. So yeah, I'm hoping they come back to AIC this yeah. year. <laughs> right. Yeah, what do you know about AIC? Is it uh, is it happening? Um, um, I'm trying to remember what I heard and whether I'm allowed to share that information. Oh, let's, let's, <laughs> I, let's, I have a little bit of an inside source that. on AIC. <laughs> uh, I'd have to go look at the website for the latest. I uh, I don't. I haven't. Uh, last I heard about it was like a few months ago, so I don't exactly remember. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Advanced Imaging Conference. Yes. Is at advancedimagingconference.com. So that's pretty easy. Um, advanced, uh, they said May 20th through the 21st is what's on their website. So that is in 2022. Yeah. Uh, so that's oh, that's right. Yeah. Familiar. I remember them talking about that. They, I think, I think there was talk of having the, uh, you know, since things are opening up, I think they were going to have it in November like usual, but I think they actually could not get the venue. So oh. I think that's why they push back to, to May, if I recall. I see. I see. Well, it's an exciting conference. Uh, you know, I've been myself and it's amazing. So um, definitely something if you can get out to San Jose in May. Uh, it's just that weekend, 20th through the 21st. Um, uh, you will not be disappointed, you know, so it's you'll learn a lot of stuff and uh, um, and you'll see some fantastic images. So. And some great gear too, by the way. And you don't have to be an advanced imager to go to the advanced imaging conference. <laughs> no, that's right. That's right. They, they welcome everybody. Yeah, yeah. I and think the they enjoy house. it when beginners come, so. Yeah, instead of the same old, old You just have to bring your appreciation. This okay. is a beautiful this eclipse. This is amazing. Track. Yeah. Now wow. this was the 2019 eclipse. Is that right, Molly? 2017 eclipse. 2017. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this one came out better than my 2019 one, uh, mm -hmm. simply because it was higher altitude. This one was at about 55 degrees up in the sky, whereas the 2019 one was only about 13 degrees high. So 
Um, this one came out a lot sharper than my 2019 one. Mm -hmm. um, this was also done with a telescope instead of a camera lens, so it came out better. But this is, this fantastic. is a, thank you. This is a composite of 10 images of various exposure times from one four thousandth of a second to one second. And I did this really cool HDR combination technique in Photoshop that's actually pretty old school. It's mm. from back from the late 90s when, um, when Photoshop was relatively new, people were importing their print pictures <laughs> into it. Uh -huh. And as called, if I recall, it's called the, the pellet method, I think. I have to go double check on what that exact name was. I have a, a blog post about it, but it's, it's just some, it's some subtractions and some multiplications. <laughs> it's all this, this kind of mathy uh, image compositing uh, to, to get this full dynamic range of the really bright inner corona with the dimmer outer corona to show up all in the same brightness range of an image. And that blue, I didn't add that in. That, that was part of the color of the one second long image. So you, you did, were able to see the blue sky uh, through the white corona, even though visually, visually the corona looked very white, um, but the camera got more of that atmospheric dispersion um, to be able to get that, that blue color. I it's love beautiful. the, uh, it has a fabric feel to it. Almost like it's a sheet, a bed say. sheet. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say it's like a bowling ball in the middle of a bed sheet. And yeah, it's it very much kind of feels that way. Um, I think there was a little bit, my, my mount um, doesn't track perfectly. So it's probably a small amount of offset between each of the frames, but it's really hard to align images when you don't have sharp lines. But I think it kind of gives it sort of a cool effect. And I think it's still a, a pretty reasonable representation of, of the corona. And uh, you, you could see visibly this huge triangle coming off here. Yes. Yeah. You can see that visually. And it was just just incredible to, to see. This, this reminds me, the, the only uh, one I saw uh, of, of a, a total uh, solar eclipse was in 2017, uh, just south in Oregon. I would drove down and 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 then what stunned me, I mean, I've seen a lot of, you know, I was preparing for it, what I would see, but nothing can prepare you for when you see the corona with your own eyes, you know, for the first yeah. time. That is that just blew me away. To actually see what you show here visually with your eyes, it's like, wow, you know, um this it just blew me away. It was that was a really memorable moment and uh you captured it really nicely here. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but I wanted to ask on, yeah. on the timing, um, the corona obviously changes, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a solar wind essentially, right? Um, it's, it's moving around. How often do you expect this, uh, this pattern to change, like, uh, you know, noticeably? So it changes on the order of hours to days. Um, yes. So over hours the to days. of a solar eclipse, you're not going to see any of that motion, any perceived motion is, is atmospheric turbulence. But... Um, uh, over the course of hours and days, it does change. So when I imaged the 2019 eclipse, it was really quite fascinating to compare the corona for the yes. two of them. And you can actually tell where you're at in the solar cycle just from kind of an amateur perspective by um, the the uh, 2019 one, as, as we really kind of dipped into solar minimum, was very ordered. It was mostly kind of a lot of this type of, of straight mm -hmm. lines as opposed to these chaotic regions. Um, and uh, yeah, I was much, much more ordered than, and this one's a little more chaotic. So I'll be very excited to see what a solar maximum solar eclipse looks like and, and how, uh, how crazy the corona is for that. Yeah. Fascinating. 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 Wonderful. Okay. I don't, how, I don't know how we can follow up after Molly's it's, It is like going on after the Beatles, right? So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. <All> right, so. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go see what my neighbor wanted, but I'll be back in a bit. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks. All right. So we are going to, um, we're going to move on. Um, uh, we have, um, uh, let's see. But how does this look to you guys? Um, bring it back to Hollywood Squares. We got Tyler Bowman up next. Tyler, why don't you go next? Oh, sure. Why not? Uh, everybody knows who I am, Tyler. Uh, I've done astrophotography probably a total, probably less than two years. Um, I do more testing since I've started working with Explore Scientific than I actually image. 
it's just got a lot of stuff to test, uh, testing people's mounts, all their stuff to make sure the customer's taken care of. Um, I don't have any pictures of my equipment. I'm a terrible, terrible person. Um, you are a terrible person, Tyler. <laughs> I know. But I, Actually, I just, he's a great person. <laughs> and he loves uh, astrophotography. But um, Go ahead. Now, you go ahead. We'll, uh, we'll... As Molly was saying, she uses a C8 or a Celestron 8 inch. I just picked up an 11 edge HD um, that I'm probably going to use for planetary deep sky. I kind of want to try uh, supernovas, um, kind of delve into that just to see, you know, I want to try something different. Not that there's nothing wrong with deep space. Um, I just want to kind of do what Jack Newton does. Um, he's definitely known for doing supernovas. Uh, and I kind of want to pursue that a little bit, especially with 28 mil, uh, 2800 millimeters of focal length. Mm -hmm. I think I shouldn't have an issue at all. <laughs> um, but yeah, put a Barlow on that. And... Yeah. <laughs> put a bar Barlow on it. I'm good to go. Put two Barlows on it. Uh, I'll just use a focal extender from Explore Scientific. There we go. Yeah, use a, use a 5X, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. um, I also got a Esprit 120. Um, then I have a Explore Scientific 102 and an 80 millimeter. Um, those are my travel scopes. The other two will be my primary home scopes. Unless I go to dark sites, then I might take one of the, the more beastly ones. Um, have a couple mounts. The mounts are a Ioptron CEM, CEM 70G. Uh, that's my travel mount, a Lozmandy G11 with PMC8. That's my home mount. That one does not leave the home. Um, mm -hmm. It's just so heavy. I don't want to. I don't want to risk anything happening to it. Um, and I also have a Star Adventure Pro or Sky Guider or Star Adventure Pro for DSLR work um, as well. Um, I got a bunch of stuff. I really do got a bunch of stuff. Um, I have been known to just buy everything and not produce any images. Oh. That's what I've been told here around work. It's like, ha, ha, ha. Well, on every, you. Almost every other day, at least every week, we see new gear coming in for Tyler. So I, you, you know. got to test it. You got to make sure it works. Like so give the information to my customers. That's what I do. That's what you do. So I'm going to share a couple screens or a screen of, uh, I got a DSO and uh, a couple other stuff. There is the witch. Oh, nice. And that was shot with the 80 millimeter with, at the time, a 294. Uh, the first rendition of the 294 with the, oh, which filter? I think it was the Ellen Hans. At the time, mm -hmm. um, a lot of exposure. Sixty seconds. That's fantastic. Uh, I can't remember how. I think it was uh, about a hundred. It was less than two hours worth of data. Not that much. Um, sixty seconds obvious, slots and, and basically like whatever fifty stacks or something. Yeah, like that, or? fifty to hundred stacks. Yeah, fifty to hundred stacks. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, wow. I, I definitely love the color. I haven't seen much color like that, and it could have been just my poor processing skills as well. Um, which that's, what sky is, what sky is, where they, uh, portal, portal five. I, five, I, okay. I shoot from the backyard. Nice. I haven't, I'm hoping this year, uh, with my wife permission that I could travel to dark skies, um, and see what my rig can and rig and telescopes can actually do. Um, cause I'm curious and I've never been to a dark sky, believe it or not. I've never been to yeah, one. That's the confession I wanted to. <laughs> to hear about there. So, <laughs> I can't wait to get him out under a dark sky so he can be completely lost under the Milky Way. It's like, I don't know where to go. I don't know I can go. say, Tyler, take, take advantage to do a lot of planning because you're going oh, go yeah. to go googly eye it there. And <laughs> there's going to be, a, there's gonna be a lot of things going on in your mind. <laughs> you want to do You have to really think about that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, definitely will. And here's this was recently done. Uh, it was my solar. Um, I'm not going to zoom in because it's really pixelated because I forgot to dither. That's how new I am at this. Uh, this was shot with the, oh, this was the 127 with the 533 from ZWO. Um, and it is, it is really pixelated because this is what happens when you don't dither like you're supposed to. 
Uh, it ends up just getting real pixelated as well. That's a nice shot. You know, I'm not, I'm not complaining about it at all. I mean, for people that say that I don't image, there you go. Now, the last, I was hoping Molly would be on because I know how much she likes the sun. Um, here's my solar that I took last Saturday. Um, with, uh, I also have a Lunt 60 millimeter. And that's what I was able to get with the Lunt. Um, the pressure tuning, I'm still trying to figure out a little bit on the left corner or the right corner, as you're seeing. When you see prominences up towards the top or flares, I'm not sure the actual, the verbiage, Molly's gonna to have to probably quote me on the verbiage of the sun, because I don't know it at all. Well, prominences is, is uh, flares is, is not quite as specific as prominences, so. Okay, yeah. so then where my little hand is, is that a flare? Um, right at the top? So no, there's different like, uh, there's, there's ones that, that don't connect and there's ones that connect um, I think it's still a prominence. Uh, I think okay. the, the really big ones, I don't know. I, I'm not super off on my, on my solar terminology, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> now there is one at the bottom left here. Let me zoom in a little more Ooh, too much. This one down here looks like it loops back in on itself. Yeah. And that's a huge, that's cool. That's yeah. And I was like, Oh, I got some, I was like, at first I thought it was a sunspot. I was like, no, I don't. And then I see the loop. I was like, Oh, that's cool. I actually got something neat. Uh, yeah. But this was shot with a 174 monochrome camera on a Lunt 60 millimeter. Um, right. So Molly, if you want to borrow a Lunt, I might. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that's the only images I got. Um, I definitely want to try Planetary as well with the C11. I know Molly mentioned that the mirror flop, which I experienced that yesterday, it's not fun. Um, but it's just a, something that I had to overcome eventually anyway uh, yeah. that's i had to give up on the on the c11 largely because when i tried to make my pointing model in uh my in my t-point model in mm -hmm. the sky x it just mm -hmm. could never get a very accurate model at all because of how Everything the mirror shifting. was moving so much yeah. on different sides of the pier um yeah i just couldn't get a great model and if, the the tyler i love your moon shots um because the moon's still alive it's it's different yeah uh, really cool. uh, but with when I get the light crawler on the back of the C11, I think that's going to help me a lot as far as the, the mirror flop. Um, and I'm going to put a micro touch on there if I want to do hyperstar imagery. I can do that as well. Uh, I mean, this this that one's going to be my versatile heavy scope <laughs> that I want to use. I have the mirror locks. The the newer ones have the the mirror locks, so definitely yes. take advantage of that if you have those. Yeah, I do, and that that's like oh. that should help a lot. Once you yes. get that focuser on there, just lock the mirror and you're set. <laughs> mm -hmm. There was a question uh, I just saw in the in the chat. Uh, Harold was saying, "What is mirror flop?" And I'm going to take a shot at answering that, and yeah. then you guys can keep me honest here. So basically, there's two different things actually. There's image shift and mirror flop. Image shift occurs when you're focusing, uh, and, and the mirror in the smith green, you, 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 when you look at the focuser knob, it's offset. So it, it, it tries to have a shaft uh, where the center of the mirror move, moves the, the focus in and out. But what happens is, is the pressure is a little bit offset. So whenever you turn it in and out of focus, the, the, uh, the pressure on the mirror is not exactly even. Yeah. So and that causes reason, an image shift. Yeah, there's and like I, a, yeah, it's better at there's this. A metal, <laughs> there's a metal tongue that kind of comes off to the side, okay? And so yes. if you look at a, at a schmidt cassegrain on the back cell, that focuser is off on one side. It's just a screw that's got, if you take it apart, you'll see that it's got a hole through the end of the screw, okay? And that's holding on to uh, just one side, like, um, uh, you know, I mean, this piece is holding onto the whole mirror, but it's pushing on one side. So as you screw it in, it's pushing, pushing, pushing. And of course, you know, the mirror's got a slide on the baffle tube, right? So it's going like this as, as you do this, you know, same thing if so you come back. If you want so to improve that, what you do is you take, you take the, the screw, the screws that are holding that focuser off, but still connected to the mirror and then run the mirror back and forth a lot of times and smooth out the grease okay because a lot of time the grease is kind of built up this will not eliminate mirror shift but it will greatly reduce it 
That's scary. <laughs> what you just said, take it off and just ram it back and forth. Ram it back and forth. <laughs> you know, that's, you'll see it's easy, but yeah. But so that's, um, that's image, that's if anybody wants to learn shift. how to do that, they can call me. So that, that, That's image shift, but that only is the focusing part. The mirror yeah. flop, technically, flop is, 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 a is, a, yeah. is, gra is a gravitational thing. That mm -hmm. what happens yes. is when you reorientate the, the, the mirror is going to be shifted to one angle. And then what happens is when you, on an equatorial or mainly on an equatorial, but on an alpha azimuth, it can happen as well. But equatorial changes the rotation. And now all of a sudden the center of balance is offset. And then your, your mirror literally flops because now the weight distribution around that ring is different. And then all of a sudden you'll have this flick because it's it's tilted right the, yeah you definitely like, you hear so the that, that it's yeah it goes thick and that, and that's mm -hmm. that's the flop so to speak so mm -hmm. that is a very uh, annoying thing so you have to let that settle and then you can take your image but it will throw it off if you're doing as image sequence mm -hmm. yeah it was very scary hearing that tick it's like oh i broke something yeah what did i do but um yeah, but you're right. It, an eight eight inches uh, is, is much better for than if you start to get a larger one. It's much more noticeable, like a C14. <laughs> like I, I haven't had a C14, but I hear from uh, from others that uh, it's it makes a big uh, big change. Right. Enough about okay. me. Let's move on. Let's move on. We do have some questions here, uh, and I'm, I'm going to recognize the audience here. We have okay. Richard Grace with us. Um, Mike Wiesner, Beatrice Hines is on with us again. That's great. Lucius Capitan, uh, he wanted to know why the moon sometimes looks orange. Okay, and it has to do with uh, uh, seeing it lower on the horizon and, um, you know, uh, the wavelengths of light. Okay, it's, it's an atmospheric thing. Also, why um, there's smoke and dust in the air. That, that true. That's, that's also true. Right. Um, uh, Harold Locke um, is with us, Jeff Wise. Um, let's see, there's some other questions here. Uh, I think I could be using, uh, oh, never mind, sorry. They are talking amongst themselves. Uh, there's conversation about the new comet that's coming, the big comet. Um, so I think that's going to be exciting. Um, and we have I haven't read much on the comet yet is it expected to brighten does anybody know you know uh i need to look at I, well I he's excited the, uh, <laughs> uh, comet observation web page let me see if i can find it it's like the one the one in 2019 was was great or 2020 was great but like it was so low on the horizon <laughs> right there are several really good comet pages. Um, and uh, let's see, this is the comet cobs.si is one of them. And it lists comets, their latest light curves. Uh, so I'm not going to dive into this right now, but um, uh, there are a few uh, comets that are um, listed as new comets. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four comets that are out there. So, um, well, hopefully, we'll get more information soon on new sources as to uh, if there are predictions, if it'll brighten or not uh, significantly. I mean, this, these things are really impossible to know for sure because uh, there's a lot of different dynamics going on between the comet and the sun. But uh, based on the orbital trajectories and stuff, you can take a guess whether it, it might get eye, like a naked eye bright or not. Um, mm -hmm. There's been some flops in, in the recent past, of course. But uh, yeah, I'll just have to keep our eyes on the news. Yes, absolutely. And, and um, uh, you know, I expect to see some beautiful astrophotography of that. Um, there was a question, somebody's, chatting just like almost in gibberish. <laughs> I, I think it might be a kid uh, chatting with us. Um, uh, Pekka Haltala wanted to know something about uh, uh, securing uh, their telescope and how much, how to calculate how much weight the screws in the tube rings, brackets, dovetail for the telescope, um, so that it can handle traction force. You guys have any ideas about that? 
Um, let me go read what he wrote. His, uh, I know Pekka, his, his uh, first language. How to, how to calculate how much weight the screws in the tube rings, brackets slash dovetail for the telescope and everything it has built into it can handle traction force. Um, so when it comes to, to metal pieces and stuff like that, um, they're generally not the weak link in, uh, in astronomical builds. Uh, metal parts can hold enormous amounts of force as long as you don't get, uh, you know, really weird or like stuff that's not sort of like, yeah, I, I think with, with, with the weights that we're dealing with as, as amateur astronomers uh, with, with our backyard telescopes, stuff like that, I don't think worrying about whether a screw or a dovetail is going to snap is, is important. Um, we're not dealing with, with enormous weights and stuff like that. And those metal parts can take quite a lot of force. <laughs> in yeah. fact, um, in the motors, so like a lot of the, so a lot of telescopes, uh, the, the mounts will have a rating of, you know, that has a payload capacity of, you know, 60 pounds or 40 pounds and, and the motors themselves and the gears, and, they can handle far more weight than that. That's payload true. Capacity. But it's just a matter of whether it's going to track well or not. Uh, and that's what that payload capacity is based on. So, I mean, you could, you could weigh overload, you know, as long as it wasn't going to tip over a, a light mount and you're not going to destroy the motors. Uh, it's just not going to track very good. <laughs> right. So, it's no, just don't so don't much worry pressure. about any of the metal components. They're all fine. <laughs> I would just add, I would just add probably the, the biggest thing you'll start to see as you start to get into imaging more is as you take a longer exposure is, is, uh, is vibrations and, uh, and, and uh, wind. Um, that's why, that's why uh, Scott has the GM 11, uh, you know, with, with a small refractor on it, that, that will be solid rock solid, you know, and that, and you, you need that. You actually do need that because, uh, sure that like Molly said, uh, it will, it will support the weight. You don't have to worry about any bro structural damage, but boy, oh boy, you'll really notice that when you do imaging, imaging with longer exposures. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's certainly awesome. you're right, Cameron. Um, I, I image on my deck. So vibrations, uh, anytime the dog tries to scratch his butt or something, you know, the, the whole picture's yeah. messed up. Um, yeah, exactly. So yeah. I, I understand the vibrations for sure. You're exactly right. Mm -hmm. and as far as the wind goes, um, I mean, that still could bounce the, the scope itself around a bit if there's any any play in the motors. But I actually, I take, I, I got, they, have, they sell these tripod bags for like camera tripods. Hmm. I got a couple of those and I put spare counterweights in them. And that really helps lower the center of gravity on the mount. So I'm less worried about wind gusts knocking it over or something like that. Uh, That's and a great idea. Some, some, some stability to the mount and uh, you, you still might have some any any play in the gears and stuff like that will come up in the wind, but it's a lot more stable against the wind. That goes for travel tripods too, because I, I got a little super light uh, compact uh, okay. travel tripod, and they have a little hook at the bottom, and then you can put extra weight, and that really makes it uh, much more sturdy. That's a yeah. good point. That's where I first got those tripod bags was when I bought a carbon fiber foldable little tripod for my trip to Chile. And I thought, well, this is a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Andrew Corkill uh, was talking about getting uh, a new one-shot color. He says, I'm still waiting for that one-shot camera that can get the detail Molly is getting. No processing, no stacking, et cetera. So, I don't know that that's no, no. true. No. <laughs> I think there's no such thing. There's no such well, thing. You have to process. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what he's looking for is what I'm looking for is is as much pre-processing as you can. So if you if you have like an the cheap way of doing it is an ASI Air Pro, right? But if you want something more powerful, you're going to need a Prima Luci or, or or a PC, a laptop that does it for you with the right software. And then basically it, it, it just stacks live stacks and it does all the uh, plate solving for you. And that's what you, but you need a lot of horsepower to do that. Sharp um, does those things for $15 a year. <laughs> yeah, good, good advice. We're gonna things. get a lot of those tips, <laughs> yeah, of those right. tips in, this, in this session. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. Cool. That's yeah. right. Um, well, I think, go ahead. Jack, 
Yeah, I think he was talking more about the processing of the of his data. But yeah. if I can recommend one camera right now, I think Tyler can back me up on this. It's the ASI 533 MC Pro. I've been using that. He's nice. only he's the only with that. He's, he's only gonna have to take darks and lights. Yeah. And I mean, basically, he would be done after that. I'm I'm gonna show <laughs> some images of the 533. And uh, but that's what I would recommend if he's not trying to do a lot of processing. Yeah, if he's trying that. to minimize processing, uh, but the new 533, the 294 Pro that just came out, uh, any of the 2600 models that ZWO just came out with, they have no amp glow. Um, I'm yeah. sure Molly has quite a bit of amp glow with her yeah. 1600. No, no, the 1600 has no amp glow. It's the 294 MC Pro yeah. that has insane amp glow. Um, but the, I actually, I, I, the 294, at least the one that I have is pretty noisy. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm actually looking at getting a different color camera at some point. Um, 2600. I have the yeah. uncool 294. Um, and I mainly got it cause it's lighter and I just wanted to get cheaply into it, uh, you know, <laughs> get, get the basic techniques. But, uh, but so that would be interesting to compare, uh, what we can do with an uncool 294 compared to a cool uh, oh, I actually have a comparison on that when I accidentally uh, forgot to turn the cooler on my 294 when I was doing a live session. Ah, yeah, and, you can operate uh, it. I'll go yeah. pull up the image because it is striking. Like, it's a lot more of an impact than you would think. So let me go pull okay. up that image while we talk. That, yeah, that would be great if you could. Thanks, Molly. Cool. Yep. Yep, yep. It is a lot of, a lot of neat stuff. And then the, the other dimension is uh, the smartphone side, of course. Um, which uh, we were talking in before is uh, you have the event. I just, I did a lookup on the, on the Samsung um, S8 um, pixel size, right? What's the, what's the size? So like your typical uh, C, uh, astronomy CMOS CCD or not CCD CMOS camera is anywhere from two to two to four micrometers. Um, the, the, uh, the camera, the CCD camera, that's on a on a uh, Samsung S8 is actually one micron, so it's actually uh, that's much smaller. So it has higher resolution because it's a very small CCD chip, right? Um, so that that's that's an interesting comparison. But um, but yeah. So I, I have that picture ready. Oh great! Let's okay. take a look. Okay. All right, so um, these oh, were wow. back to back, same night, same conditions within about 10 or 15 minutes of each other uh, using my 1600 mm Pro on my eight inch McCassick grain with an H alpha filter. And on the left is a three minute exposure at 17 degrees Celsius. And on the, uh, on the right is the same exposure time, same gain, negative 21 Celsius. You can see the difference is, is striking. Huge difference. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, and I stretched Jeez. these two to be the same level so that it's a fair comparison. You, you know what's it's happened, shocking, Molly? Shocking. And I think I don't see that because guess what? Because I had an alpha azimuth, I can't go beyond 30 seconds uh, exposure. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I don't get the noise. But yeah, I, I tried to go to 180, but I have too much uh, rotation in the uh, yeah. two axes. So it does a, always a correction. And I'll we'll talk about that later. But, uh, but basically, uh, yeah, this is 180 seconds. That really shows you the noise building up oh my gosh yeah, yeah thanks that's a good advice yeah i'm glad to finally have have happened to have gotten an image that's that's a fair comparison between cooled and uncooled about as fair yeah. a comparison as i think you can get so thank you that's uh, yeah it, yeah I, I get a cool camera it's worth your money <laughs> it, it is and i'll i'll get there I, I mainly want to get the um the process flow and i do want to have a second camera so this will be kind of i'll be able to use it as a second camera in the future but uh but before I dive fully in and get the, you know, grand over a thousand dollar cameras, cool cameras, I wanted to kind of figure things out with it, with a, with this one. Cause they yeah, are on sale. I think they were like 700 bucks, 699 yeah. or something like that. So Just that was really good. Cameras game. make great planetary cameras because the exposure time is so short. You don't, uh, there's no difference on whether it's cool or not as far as the noise level, at least. No good advice. Cameras. So they make great planetary cameras. Um, and especially if it has USB 3.0, all the better. Cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's introduce um, uh, um, Charles McEwen. Uh, uh, Charles uh, is um, uh, doing um, some color work right now. And uh, 
he goes by the his he, he likes to go by the name of Chuck. Uh, I think we should have like nicknames for everybody, but you know we'll we'll stick with the real names right now. And uh, and you're doing deep sky or narrowband imaging. And um, why don't you tell them all about it, Chuck? Yeah, uh, just a little bit of background. I've been uh, so I got in astronomy probably four to five years ago, and I viewed for. I viewed for a year and then uh, I've been doing astrophotography for three years, but um, how I got into it, I basically moved to a dark site and I saw the Milky Way, uh, like a good shot of the Milky Way or a good, you know, view of the Milky Way for the first time. And it just kind of grabbed me. Um, but uh, I've always used Explore's product and I was in a career that I was not liking and I reached out to Explore and they offered me a job. Now I'm here. But um, mainly I've been using, let me see, let me share the screen. There you go. Ooh, one second. You're showing your desktop right now. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm moving it over. Okay. So yeah, that's the ED one. Can y'all see? Yeah. Okay. So that's the ED 127. And uh, I actually got the Pegasus focuser on the back and the Pegasus power box underneath all these USB hubs. Um, I believe I have the 0.7 reducer. This is a three inch focuser from TS optics. And I got the 294 in the back with a filter drawer. That is the ZWO uh, 60 millimeter guide scope. Um, that's one of ZWOs. Uh, I forgot what camera that is, to be honest with you. Uh, but I've lately, well, actually the past year and a half, I've been going back between 666 focal length to 950. Um, I mean, it's just a great scope. I mean, if anyone's in the market for a scope, I'd go with that just because the what you can do with that thing is amazing, uh, especially with that 0.7 reducer. It can frame pretty much any deep sky object out there. Um, but I'll show you all some of my images. Also, let's see, show side view. So I've got it sitting on the Skywatcher EQ6R Pro. And basically I, uh, I go between this scope, the ED-127, FCD-100 and the, uh, the Explore Scientific ED-102, and I have the 102 on our XS2 PMC-8 mount, which is a great mount. Really, that mount is, I'll put it side by side to that Skywatcher mount any day. Um, I'm, I really like uh, Explore's mount. I, I get my trackings just as well as that Skywatcher, but let me show you all some images. I didn't save any to my laptop. I'm just going to pull them over to Insta uh, from Instagram. I started a new Instagram. Um, I've got a lot. Of, I think I have like over 20 pictures on my desktop. So um, I'm going to be, I'm pretty much been uploading either every day or every other day. But this was shot with the Canon RA and I sold the RA for the, so I could buy that ED-127 and I missed that camera so much. Um, Too bad I have looked, one for you. Yeah. But I can't, I think I did this with a lens. I thought I did this with the Z61 by William. We lose um, his audio kind of voice. Yeah, Chuck went a little quiet there. I can hear Chuck, you, Chuck. your microphone is, is. Uh... Okay, can y'all hear me? We hear you, but very faint. Yeah, we hear you through other people's microphones. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure how to fix that right now. Uh... It's getting louder. Okay. Is that good? It's a little quiet. Try unplugging your microphone and plugging it back in. Technical difficulties as always with astrophotographers. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, That's all part of the journey. Yeah. It is part of the journey. Yeah. Uh, it is part of the journey. It's weird so, that his voice is nice and quiet, clear, yeah. and then all of a sudden, boom. Stop sharing. There it goes. That's better. That's better. Should I go back to Sharon? Can you all yeah, hear me? Yeah, no, it's you're good. Sure. You're, you're good. You're good. So 
So, Chuck, uh, I, one thing quickly. Uh, the 127, is it a triplet or a, a doublet? Oh, I'm sorry. It's a triplet. It's the it's the ED-127 triplet with the FCD-100 glass, which is oh. – it. It's basically the same glass as the FPL beautiful. 53. Oh my gosh, that's a beautiful instrument. Five inch refractor triplet FCD 100. That is massive. That's beautiful. Yeah, and then uh, like I said, that's a good trade. Draw- that's a good trade. You know, I know you missed your camera, but that's a good trade. <laughs> yeah, and when you put that 0.7 reducer in there, you know, you have. I mean, the F ratio drops down to 5.25, and wow, again, you have a focal length of 666, and it, if you put a big san- sensor back there, that sensor with that reducer can capture, can frame the whole rosette nebula without having to like crop any of the nebula. So, um, it's like three de- three degree field of view type of thing, or I'm not what? sure. Yeah, I'm not sure on the actual degree. I would have to look into it for you. But yeah, we can uh, figure that out. But uh, that's a big one. That's a beautiful swath of sky. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll go to. Uh, let me go to. I'll go to something. Let's see. These are all your pictures, eh? Wow, yeah. Nice. Thor this, Helmet. Yeah, this was the with the ED-102. I kind of clipped the date a little bit, but I really don't care because I like it. Um, this was shot with the Optolong L-Extreme filter, which is a dual narrowband filter of HA and O3. Um, I shot this, I think, about a year ago. And I actually had a 0.79 reducer in there also. But this was this is with the 533, and uh, really what I've noticed with the 533, if you're shooting narrowband, you don't have and your imaging trains clean, you really don't have to take flats or bias or dark flats. All all you need is dark frames and a lot of light frames with that with that camera. If like I said, if you're shooting narrowband, because I haven't I haven't used that camera yet with just like with a broadband filter or um you know true you know without a filter in, in a dark site and then let's see the pinwheel galaxy this was with the asi 294 mc pro and the ed 127 um i really like this image a lot and like i said i'm gonna be posting a lot so usually in a couple months i'll have all my images up here this is another shot um, with that Canon RA of Andromeda. That's a nice one. That's very nice. I have a yeah. hard time getting blue on on galaxies, so well, yeah. That, yeah, that's you can thank the Canon RA for that because <laughs> the Canon RA just picks up all that color. And then let's see. I'll show one more, and then I'll switch it over to Ross. Um, this is this is one of my favorite ones. This is like really my my first uh, like successful project I've ever had. I actually shot this with an RC8 um, by Orion, and this I actually shot this on our mount too. Um, so that just goes to show you how much weight that XS2 can handle. Um, because I had an RC8 with the ZW with not the ZW the William Octus Z61 on top guiding for me. And uh, this is one of my favorite images that I've ever did. But I shot this is the 294 also MC Pro. Love the Orion and Nebula. Love it, love it, love it. And I can't wait until I get my IXS2 because then I can move from Alta Azimuth to Equatorial. I need Equatorial now. <laughs> yeah. You got to pick up one of ours. But yeah. That's it. Um, like I said, I'm going to be posting a lot on my Instagram. That's a new Instagram. So um, it's just my name, Charles McEwen or Charles McCowan. Um, but yeah, that's all I got. Thank you all for letting me uh, share some images. Wonderful. Wonderful. So uh, now that you've been here for a while, uh, what, what's your experience like? Yeah. You talking about with the company or yeah, the company, the customers, uh, you being in, uh, you know, in customer service. Yeah. I mean, things, your boss is listening. Well, <laughs> yeah. Careful. I'm to, That's right. Yeah. I'm taking careful. Down notes right now. Okay. <laughs> no, okay. So I was in the car business and the car business is really stressful. And basically I was just, I did not want to get to work every day, but now I actually get to get up and go to work and do something I love. Um, 
the only thing I've been having trouble with is I just need to uh, start learning a little bit more about everything. And uh, especially when it comes to binoculars and spotting scopes, but uh, it lived up to my expectations, I guess. I mean, <laughs> good. Yeah. So like I said, I, I really enjoy it. It's a lot better than what I was doing. And like I said, I get to come to work and talk to people every day about imaging and telescopes and mounts and, you know, astronomy stuff in general. So. Right. Okay. Well, great. Great. So I, I hope it adds to your uh, astronomy experience and, um, you know, I look forward to seeing more shots uh, from you. All right. So Ross, uh, you're up next here. Hey guys. Well, I just want to thank everybody for having us and thank Scott for having this show. I think it's really, really cool. And uh, I think we found out about it yesterday and said, Hey, you guys are on. <laughs> We're, we're really excited and it's super fun because uh, we all love astrophotography and we all love looking at the stars. And I've been doing it for about the same amount of time Chuck has. And I started with Explore Scientific as well. Um, I remember I came in and I had seen all these pictures and um, I, I got on AstroBin and I saw, okay, that's how they're doing it. That's the equipment that they're using. This is what I can expect to get. And so I saw how much it was going to cost and I thought all right well I've got a four-year-old kid I can say it's for science and um so I Friends. used a little bit yeah yeah I um mm -hmm. I used my kid to to let me spend a whole bunch of money on some nice telescopes and I have just fallen in love and he loves it too he loves pressing the button on the mount and making it move he loves seeing the stars fly across the screen um you know, when we're doing short exposures and we're trying to um, center the star, he, he really enjoys that. And so it's a fun time for us to be out there together. And uh, well, Chuck and I and Tyler, we're in customer service and we're taking questions all day. And so this is kind of an idea. We want to take your questions that you guys have here on YouTube. We want to troubleshoot them right now and we want to we want to solve them for you all and get everybody taking phenomenal pictures. Um, and so I can show you some of mine. I have, most of these are with the Explore Scientific 102. Uh, it's an awesome, it's an awesome scope. It's a great scope. And um, I've gone a little more uh, into the wider field. Um, as you might find out, the more zoomed in you are, the more precise and the more exact uh, you need to be. And um, I am not great at that all the time. Um, and so it is easy shooting in a shorter focal length um, you, you do have some errors that you, that you can, uh, kind of forget about, but so I'll show you guys some photos real quick. And we'll start here. So we were just talking about comments. So I wanted to pull up, um, a little oh, check that out. Very nice. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. And, um, I, one of my buddies sent me a text message because once you start taking astrophotographies and or astrophotos, you send them to your friends and then every single time there's a full moon or, or any kind of uh, astronomical event, they're all texting you. Do you know about this? Do you know about that? And right. so he, <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't know, but he texted me and I was, Oh, well, man, I'll, I'll get, so this is the only video I've ever taken. Um, but it was awesome. Very cool. I like it. Made me, yeah. It made me really happy. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what and, this is, the, Ross, how, how did, is this like a number of images that you just, uh, put together in a video or, or how did you do this how, how much so, time yeah yes sir over? Yeah. Uh, so i believe this was three hours and what i was doing was i was taking 20 second photos and then um i would take all the 20 seconds in 10 minutes and i would stack those into one photo and then so this is each time it blinks the screen blinks is 10 minutes exposure that's awesome 20 second photos to kind of I don't know. I, I just. That's a very good technique because what you can do is this can be extended to a lot of different, any, any uh, solar system objects, right? Including asteroids or whatever. It's like a blink comparator, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Right. And you just keep on doing this. And because if you have an equatorial mount, uh, you can really get the same orientation uh, with your imaging and then even take it on consecutive nights um, and, and do the similar type of thing. This is, this is fantastic. Well, I, Love the, it. the comments really are exciting uh, to me. And um, just 
yeah, having having the action, the movement uh, is, is very fun. So this is another one uh, that I hope you all can see. This is Abel 39. And um, I, this is what this photo just makes me so proud. It's still on uh, the video. I think you're still sharing oh, the video. Still on the video? Yeah. Okay, yeah, let me. Yeah. I, I am not well versed with uh, Zoom yet, guys. So let me Ross, go. real fast. Did you stack that in Deep Sky Stacker, or would you stack that? It was stacked in Deep Deep Sky Stacker. Yeah. Um. Oh. Okay. So let's stop share, and I'm gonna try to share again. I'll get better yeah. at this, guys. Josh um, Kovac wants to know what's the total, the full exposure time there on that. Four uh, four hours, I believe, Josh. Four mm -hmm. hours. Oh, this they, is a beautiful planetary nebula. Oh. Yeah. Oh, wow! You. Look I at just that. Did this one recently as well. Oh, that, it's hard. It's, it's a dim guy. In, it in is. Texas. Well, the, um, yeah, Abel 39, it's it's beautiful. And it's it's such a good circular planetary nebula. Um, and if you've got a bigger scope or some more time, um, you can actually see galaxies inside the nebula. And it is just uh, truly fascinating to see some really good images of Abel 39. Uh, one thing I thought was super cool that I remember reading um, was just how faint it is. The, it's like a 15 magnitude. And if you, if you do the math, um, it's like 1 million or 2 million times dimmer than Sirius, the bright star. So I just think that's cool to have a picture of something so dim. Well, the other thing um, is, you know, you, what, what aperture were you using? 102, you said? That was 102. So, you know, come on. I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's an 18 inch dog, you know, type of stuff in the right. sky type of thing you're talking about. So to be able to pick that out and, you know, it's, it's, it's just a one, very rewarding. And then when you talk about yeah. galaxies, I love galaxies and, you know, and, and you can start to pick out like 15th magnitude, 16th, 17th mm -hmm. magnitude galaxies if you do the right imaging processing. And it just is, it becomes endless fun. <laughs> yep. Well, this is, this is a new shot. This is um, Albereo. And I, I never am sure if I'm pronouncing my star names correctly. So forgive forgive all the people smarter Alberio than me pretty often alberio um but this well, is no, this is the wide either. field uh 200 mm 200 millimeter focal length um that is in h alpha um this is that was my first this this is the soul nebula here and it was my first time i put together narrow band data um and wow. that yeah that's it was it, that's 44 hours with the 102 um, with uh, Explore Scientific 102 carbon that's fiber. Time. That's awesome. Um, and then that's the that's my most recent one. Oh. Um, it's got the crescent, the tulip nebula, and um, uh, Sadir, Sadir, Sadir. Uh, there's oh. another star name I can't nice. pronounce. Yeah, I don't but, know how um, many there. I say Sater, Sater. Sater, yeah. I I I don't know. I, I yeah. <laughs> well, um, so I really love it. I think it's. Uh, ton of fun and, and it's it's very rewarding like like you were saying Cameron and so um you know we're just we're just excited to have this show and uh, I was talking to a, a guy here at work uh, because it's kind of the hunt for perfection you know where we're that's what a lot of these people you have oh it's just the teeny one arc second which is the size of a dime like two miles away um so we really are hunting for perfection but we got to remember not this is what Kent said uh not to let uh, our search for perfection take away from our enjoyment. And, um, right. you know, it's very right. the, and, but the hunt the is, yeah, that, the journey is what's, what's so fun and so rewarding. Um, and so I just, I can't wait to uh, be on the journey with you guys now. Yeah, absolutely. Great. It's like a treasure hunt. Awesome. I, to me, it's like a treasure hunt. <laughs> yes, yeah, I think, yes, sir. I think half the fun of astrophotography is all the troubleshooting and just you know it, it can't it can't it can't be fun and very rewarding you must be having a lot or of it can be frustrating and you just snap your, snap your laptop yeah you're hired already charles <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's awesome okay all right so and uh and and cameron uh, uh I, I just i just have one thing i just one thing thanks okay um Actually, it's uh, it's it's along what Ross was asking. Um, I do have a question for this okay. this audience, uh, and um, it's relevant 
relative to what we were talking about earlier. And I wanted to share some of my screen here. Um, let me just, but before I do, I let me, yeah, just put a quick spiel, uh, you know, my little elevator speech. Yeah, I love uh, astroimaging. Uh, I think it's fair to say that I'm more on the EAA side. Uh, I'm, my, my background is it's observational. I, I used to have an 18 inch dog. And to be able to use a small scope with imaging to enhance uh, my observing experience in my own backyard at convenience, especially he being up here in the Pacific Northwest when it rains all the time. Yeah, uh, we have, uh, you know, to be every moment to be able to really enjoy the time under the stars when you have it, and then and then be able to uh, go deeper um, with 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 the imaging technology that we have uh, is where I'm really after. So even if it's noisy image, I do obviously, you know, to Ross's point and. You know, I really admire what Molly's doing. I, I definitely will get perfected, but I'm looking more at the uh, the, the workflow and the the experience and enjoying the journey, and then getting better as I get that process long. And then I will get a cool camera. I will get that. I do want to have basically less noisy images and all that uh, down the road because I'm kind of I'm focused on a sky survey. I'm trying to do a lot of viewing or a lot of capturing, and then I basically pick out all those those obscure objects that people kind of neglect and 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 uh, and find because usually they're in a remote star field you know with go to mount for example even with an 18 inch dog sure you can see the hercules ga ga galaxy cluster but you know have fun identifying all the individual galaxies you know that are 15th yeah. magnitude you know when you can have you know your your imager and then you have you, know, you can go deeper you can play with some of the settings so that's what I'm going to actually share with you, and then I have a question. So let me uh, okay, let me share my screen. Uh, and I have a I have a comment here uh, from uh, Jeff Wise. He says Cameron's approach to astrophotography and visual astronomy has invigorated me. I was way too frustrated trying to get things perfect. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, Jeff has been great. We 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 corresponded now, and uh, it's I think we have a really good uh, collaboration. Uh, he has a lot of he has an awesome setup. Uh, and um, and then we'll you know we've been already exchanging those so I appreciate that comment thanks Jeff um, so yeah so we're uh, in the well, a while ago I took a picture of the Hercules galaxy cluster here and um, this is the uh, field of view uh, uh, centered around NGC six zero four seven and if I go to my um, if I go to my uh, uh, what do you call it uh, sky safari sky safari thank you Molly I just had a Brain fart there for a second. That's the airport. My favorite History. planetarium app. Yeah, it's really it's really nice. I mean, I, I was mentioning the other. I love paper star charts. I have a Sky Atlas 2000 here, wonderful. But as I'm getting older and and I, my eyesight isn't so good at night, uh, when I you know to be able to have a, a illuminated um, star chart like this, where I can also track and record uh, my observations, is ex and zoom in and do visual plate solving is extremely invaluable. So here we go. I'm going to zoom back in. So here's, oh, this is NGC, sorry, wrong one. This is uh, that other one. Let me uh, go back. History 6047, there we go. Center on that guy. Okay, so there's the center of the galaxy. If I go like, I've set the timing here to the same time. It was 11.30 on, uh, on Wednesday evening uh, last week, or this week, actually. So I zoom in. So here's the, here's the actual field. And I'm going to bring that up mainly to show you the size, uh, the dimension. So here's the, and here's the image I took. Okay, so uh, my there's a couple of things on this image that are obviously uh, not not optimum. Um, the first thing is obviously the, the noise. We already talked about that. That's because it's pretty high, warm temperature. But more importantly, there's this big netting, uh, and then also there's this uh, field rotation, and I'll explain. Uh, what I think this is. Uh, so this is this image was taken uh, of a stack uh, of ten using um, using ASIR Pro. So I stacked ten images. So ten images at thirty second pop. So basically uh, five minutes essentially. So this is five minutes of rotation field rotation essentially. So you can see that the end these edges are kind of clipped and rotated uh, by essentially five minutes at that latitude uh when because when when sky sorry when asir pro does the stacking the live stacking it does the plate solve 
and then it starts rotating and rotating and rotating and stacking the images. So that was good. Um, but but what happens, the other thing is I don't have, you can see how it's blown out in the middle and then it's fainter on the edges because of big netting. My question to to this team, uh, Molly probably, uh, or Ross or, or Chuck, um, my question is my image train, I only have 40, around 40 millimeters of back focus. Um, I'm, I'm support, I need to have another 16.5 spacer, which I'm getting to make it 55 millimeters. And the question is, is this big netting caused by, because of the back focus and then clipping on the, uh, on the tube, or is it caused by uh, temperature? Um, is that full sensor? frame, Cameron? What's that? This is, this is a four third sensor. This is a 294 MC, regular, non, okay. non cool. And which is again? It's a, it's a C8, um, it's a C8. And uh -oh. if I go, if I show you my image, I have a, let me just go to that slide. Yes, uh, uh, are you using a focal reducer <laughs> with it? I'm using an F63 focal reducer, oh, yep. And let me let me just go and open. I'll show you what I was using. So it's, uh, this is my image, my, my rig set up here. Are you using a filter at all, either? And I was using a UHC, uh, off the long okay. UHC filter, actually. What uh, size? Even for galaxies, it was a, it was a almost full moon, right? So, mm -hmm. was it, yeah. Was so it a one here. and a quarter inch or a two inch filter? Cameron. Uh, two two inch, uh, forty eight millimeter. Yeah. So, okay. so this is what I got. It's a two inch. Uh, so, so mm -hmm. I got the uh, Optolong two inch. Let me move this out of the way. Um, so basically, uh, this is the filter I was using, uh, two inch mm -hmm. UHC uh, Optolong. And then I had F63. Uh, I have my my T adapter. 50, I guess this is 50 millimeters. This guy here is about 21 millimeters. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the nose piece of, of this guy is like 11 millimeters, and then another 6.5. Anyway, you add it all up. Basically, well, I'm 16.5 millimeters too short. Um, so, so, yeah. I think, Cameron, I think Cameron, that focal reducer is probably going to have an image circle of 30 millimeters. Yeah. Like that. And, and so you're probably up. I mean, you're getting that image circle. It's not even going to be at 100%. Ross can't hear you. Yeah, Ross, we can't hear. So basically, it's your reducer that's causing the. Well, so so from so first of all, a square chip on a circular aperture. There's always going to be a little bit of vignetting. Yes. Um, from using my C8, I had less vignetting with my focal reducer than I did without. I think the focal reducer expands the image circle a little bit from native um, as part of its, its optics, but I don't have the exact numbers on me, but I think the image circle is pretty close in size to the size of a four thirds chip. So uh, I think it's something like 30, 33 millimeters or something. And the diagonal of a four thirds chip on the 294 is what, 29, 30 millimeters. So it's really close uh, to the size of that image circle. So that amount of vignetting is actually not that bad. <laughs> oh, okay. And if you, if you, if you take flats, that will yes. help. And if you run dynamic background extraction or uh, yeah, the dynamic background extraction will help with that. Cause that vignetting is not, is not too bad. That's actually pretty easy to deal with. Okay, good, good. So th thank you. I just wanted to make sure that I'm getting the right data. Uh, as I start doing my survey, that I don't get a whole bunch of junk. I want to get, you know, the the, the best I can. Um, but uh, but thanks. That that's really helpful. Because so you do you think having the fifty five millimeter versus uh, versus uh, forty millimeter back so focus? The, do you think that will cause any change in in vignetting? Um, so the distance. So the focal radius is going to have a specific distance that setting it. Um, setting your camera back from it will achieve the optimum amount of, of field flattening. Um, that mainly helps with, with coma, but yes. I, I'm not sure if it will help with vignetting or not, but it, it will help with coma. And I, and I, think, I think it's a lot bigger than that. I thought for, for so I have a Mead uh, 6.3 reducer and I thought it was like 130 millimeters. <laughs> well, for the... Uh, I think it's for the, uh, I know for the C11, it is over a hundred and it's like 133 millimeters of back focus for mine. 
Yeah. Um, I don't know about the eights though. I don't think honest. I don't think the the back focus um, from the reducer matters as to what telescope it's on, whether it's mm -hmm. on the eleven or the eight. I could mm -hmm. be wrong, but I don't think that that's the case. Yeah. Keep in mind that there was a moon, you know, you know, just to the. Okay. Yeah. East. So we're seeing moonlight here. Yeah. So this, this is, is, this is probably moonlight as well. Yeah. So right? doing a flat frame and running something like uh, dynamic background extraction and pixel sight will clean that right up. Okay. And then what about darks? Does that, that are darks only for the noise? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That helps. And you can see just to, just to finish uh, up, uh, you can see the amp flow here on the top right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely a, a very distinct amp flow. It only seems to be in the in the in this corner here, uh, yeah. which is that's pretty uh, typical is, for it's normal it. for ZWO yeah. cameras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but and what, actually, that's not so bad because my my two nine four has well, you have to get pretty long exposures to get it to come up uh, to the level of the light in your images. Um, but mm -hmm. so I, if I take ten minute exposures with my two nine four. It will be almost as bright as the dimmest parts of the image, but yes. um, f dark frames take that right out, and uh, it's pretty easy to manage. Even though the amp glow on the two nine four MC Pro looks like somebody's literally shining a, a, a <laughs> spotlight in the corner. <laughs> I, I believe, yeah, because you got it cooled and you eliminate the noise, and now it all it's really it must be prominent. I can imagine, yes. Yeah, 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 but it's 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 you have to take really long exposures for it to show up in your light frames, uh, just because it, it is a, like if if you stretch your dark frame, it will look super bright. But that's because your dark frame is very dark. So it yeah, you really have to have long long exposures for the amp glow to show up in your light frames to any yeah. level. And doing a dark correction, uh, dark using dark frames takes care of that right away. That's cool. And it, just the last last thing just. I just wanted to go back, flick back and forth. I overlaid the uh, the sky safari with That's the cool. image here, and and the cool part about that, I want you to focus in on on, on these galaxies right here. Yeah. Um, and then basically, you can see there's a cluster of about yeah. three smaller galaxies beside the one. And if you go back, oops, sorry, you go back and forth, you can easily mm -hmm. see. And then if you actually awesome. go to that in sky safari, and then I'll mm -hmm. I'll wrap up. Is if you go to sky safari. This bright one is quite bright. It's 13.3 magnitude, right? Um, but if you go to these guys, 15.4, and then this guy here, uh, he's 17.7. Magnitude 17.7. I mean, yeah. you have no chance of picking that up, you know, and this is with moon, uh, you know, and, and by the way, I'm using a new HC filter uh, for galaxies, right? Because it's broad enough that you can pick up on that light that, and it blocks enough of the, uh, the moon glow. But still, I mean, I mean, this is something I would have dreamed of, and then to be able to do this, so I'm I'm just totally addicted to um, to this oh, yeah. uh, this capability now. It's it's uh, the same feeling that you have, Molly, when you were showing the the faintness of the outer shell of uh, of uh, of Dumbbell Nebula, uh, and then you know, and then the other image of Abel was at 39, uh, yeah. Russ. Yeah, and then being able to dig deeper and deeper it's just uh really cool so thanks very much for letting me uh share that that's uh yeah, yeah. i love i love hunting through any frame I, I, there's there's galaxies all over the place so it's really fun yes. to hunt through your images especially ones in galaxy rich regions like uh coma berenices and virgo and stuff like that um and and compare it to a star chart, either Sky Safari or plate solve it in, uh, in you, you can you can plate solve and, anno and have images automatically annotate in PixInsight. So you can go see, uh, oh, wow. hunt down those PGC and UGC galaxies and then go look up their, their magnitudes. And you'd be amazed at what your telescope can get when you stack images. Uh, oh, I think I've gotten awesome. 18th magnitude galaxies before. Wow. And um, you know, the more you stack, the deeper you'll be able to probe to a limit. But um, yeah, it's it's really fun to go through and see just how little dim of a you know 100, 200, 300 million light year galaxy. Yes. Captured with your with your camera, like the stuff is is far away. And you can also image image quasars, which are wow. uh, some of the brighter ones. You can actually see them visually. Some some of the brighter quasars are like magnitude twelve. Um, but they're like a billion light years away and then wow. you have that be on your imaging record of imaging something that was a billion light years away or seeing it visually you know what i like also molly is, is when you have the uh the, the depth of field like the ring nebula 
has two galaxies uh, that are one, one is a 15th magnitude and another one's a 17th magnitude. Yeah. And uh, and I, I, I took a picture. I was playing around with that the other day. And it's like, wow, you can actually see them. And, and like you see, they're hundreds of like millions of light years away. And it's like, it's so cool in the same field, right? Right through the, the Milky Way, you can still see yeah. the galaxies That's on so the other cool. side. It's, it's fun. And that shows the power of these modern cameras. Like, uh, so I, I was doing an experiment with the Ring Nebula and I took a whole bunch of 10 second exposures. And even in a single 10 second exposure on my monochrome camera, I picked up the core of that magnitude 15 galaxy in a single 10 second exposure. Oh, that's the grain. I now, need a monochrome. It's a yeah. lot better when I stack it, but yes. if you go look at a single frame and you know where to look, it's there. And like, yeah. that's incredible. That's, that, that, well, that, that's it, Molly. My next one is going to be a cool monochrome camera. I'm going to go pro now. <laughs> yeah, I recommend. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge difference just between my, my color, yeah. my one shot color camera and my in my monochrome camera, even though they're both cool, they're both like in the same class of, of CMOS sensor, uh, huge difference with the quality of my images from the monochrome camera. Of course, it's a lot more work, but yes. um, my monochrome images are always, always better than my color camera images, especially yeah. with the ability to do narrowband and have all the narrowband signal hit the chip instead of just some of it, so. Yeah, I need to hold myself back because I still want to crawl before I walk, you know, because uh, yeah. so I, I'm kind of making sure that the, the process, that the, the workflow is is digestible, right? I mean, I, I got a sense from Tyler, for example, you, you get all this equipment, it's kind of overload, right? And, 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 and you need time to do three different things. One is uh, you need time to look at your equipment, get familiar with that, make sure you know all that stuff, and, you know, dry run it and make sure you're all good there. Second of all, you need to do the planning. What, what objects you're going to see and how you're going to see them, conditions and all that. Get all your right gear together for that particular session. And then finally, the, the observing itself, right? And making sure that workflow is efficient so that well, yeah. all those come together, right? Um, Cameron, the planning is that that's my hardest thing. I took uh, the telescope to Colorado. We get up in the mountains. I don't have any cell phone service. And I'm thinking, what am I going to take a picture of? <laughs> I got everything there. And, yeah. and uh, I didn't I didn't know what to take a picture of. But yeah, the, the planning is very important. Yeah. Luckily, we have many rainy nights here in Seattle. So I have lots of time to plan and, and practice using my equipment. So it's kind of forced me to, to have that mentality mm -hmm. <laughs> so that whenever I have a clear night, it's like very, very productive. Yes. Right? I, I try yes. to yeah. do this most. Those, yeah. those like hazy nights and full moon nights and nights that are going to get clouds in like two or three hours, those are great nights to just practice using your gear. Take exposures, yep. like even if, it, even if clouds are rolling through and it's not going to make a nice image, you've got an experience in how to capture the image or how to, how to polar align or how to align the mount and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so those suboptimal nights are really good for, for that learning process. Yeah, like one night, Molly, uh, the other night, actually two nights ago, my mount uh, lost Wi-Fi connection and then it, the clouds started rolling in, the high clouds. And I said, like, you know what, I'm just going to take some darks. So I just put the, 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 put the cover on and just yeah. did some darks at that temperature. And it's like, yeah. great, I got some darks, you know, take some time and, and uh, you know, try to maximize that time. You're doing work. You're yeah. doing work. Yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. always, there's always something to do. And yeah. when it's cloudy, I pull out my DSLR and I do, I do cloud time lapses. You know, there's, there's always, always something to image. Uh, yeah. Even if you're out of the weather or so, some, some movement you can make, getting flat frames, getting dark frames. Uh, yeah, there's always something you can be doing every night. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Well, great. I hope that uh, uh, hope you all had a good time uh, uh, introducing uh, yourselves and sharing your passion with uh, our group. Um, I think we had, uh, I think our audience really is enjoying this uh, venue and the format of the show so far. Uh, we've got a lot more coming up, uh, but I do, I have a question for the audience. What would you like to see in our next episode? Let's see what they come up with here. Oh boy. Ah. Oh boy. I need like some thinking music or. Jeff Wise yeah. just likes it. Okay, great. <laughs> also, can I, I was going to say something for the audience. Sure. Uh, Ross and I and Tyler, we're also, um, 
you know, in future videos do, uh, you know, show, show, show people how to actually use this equipment. So I think that would be great. Do some yeah, they, videos on that. Yeah. Like from polar lining, how to set up my mouth the correct way. Um, like 15 steps to get perfect pictures. Uh, what does it take to get to that point? Um, you know, there's a lot that goes on to this hobby and people just think that, Oh, I'm just going to buy all this stuff and everything will work. Like it does in the, everybody else's pictures. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> a lot of learning, lots of learning. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, see I'm seeing kind of a consensus here of planetary imaging and lunar imaging, okay. solar imaging. Well, I know I can do it. Ross mm -hmm. might be out of, might be in I, trouble with this. <laughs> with the 200 millimeter. With your 200 millimeter. Jeff oh, Wise yeah. wants to know how to do EAA with inexpensive or free software. Okay. Um, Sharp cap. <laughs> I agree with Molly. Sharp cap is the number one way. Yeah. Or alignment so it's, tips it's, and tricks. Most of the functions in it are, are free. And then for $15 a year, a year. Yeah, isn't fifteen dollars basically get, free? I mean, you know. Yeah, it's basically free. You can get, you can have. They have an excellent polar alignment routine that's a lot mm -hmm. like the um, uh, the pole master, but mm -hmm. easier and better and faster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you don't have to buy a camera. <laughs> yep. Um, uh, it's got a live stacking feature that will also subtract your. Uh, it will also do the dark and flat correction if you have those files loaded. Mm -hmm. it, it's. They're adding new features all the time. Now it has plate solving uh, so that it'll actually tell you where if you, if you give it, if you connect it to your mount, it will center the object by commanding your mount, just like how Sequence Generator Pro and, and other uh -huh. software do. Um, wow. So it's and, like PHT uh, on steroids. Yeah, yeah, so it, this is not, it doesn't guide, but it will it it will talk to PhD to to uh, pause it um, when you're running and like uh, it, it will it will talk to it in a limited way. Um, you can connect those two together. I do live stacking a lot on uh, yeah live stacking yeah. star party. Can you do an, can oh, SharpCap do like an imaging sequence across multiple objects? That's the one thing that it cannot do. And uh, so if Nina, you can right. really sequence it, you can say, take this many pictures that are this much exposure time and, and go. Um, but uh, you have to change targets yourself. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a system for that, um, Molly? Uh, oh, well, for my, so for my, for my imaging, my semi-autonomous Molly goes to sleep imaging. I use sequence yes. generator. So, um, so for sharp cap, I, I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there on the computer during a live show and I just slew around to different targets uh, myself. And, I, and for, for slewing um, on the Paramount, I use uh, the Sky X and I use the Sky X to center the target as well. And for um, on my Ioptron, uh, I can, I can, the little Ioptron command center lets you select a target. Uh, and then I'll center that either myself or have Sequence Remeter Pro do it. <laughs> yeah, because I want to get well, to a I... point where I'm uh, where I can actually similar to what you do, except instead of one one uh, one object uh, for the night, uh, setting it up and then going to the bed and letting it finish up. Uh, I, I want to actually set up a, a sequence and say I want to look at you know yeah. all the things in the, in in this in this uh, grouping, these ten objects or whatever, and then have you know a number. of but in order to do that, you need it has to be reliable. Obviously, it has to be equatorial. There's a lot of things, right, that have to come yeah. into play. I can imagine, yeah. but but uh, um, the, you need to have the right software to be able to do both, right? Yes, yeah, so uh, I use Sequence Pro, and it does all the things. It it yeah. um uh, talks to the focuser, to the telescope mount, to the uh, to PhD and all the stuff. But uh, there's an, there's another kind of relatively new open source software called Nina that I haven't used Nina. yet, but it does mm -hmm. many it's of those good. functions and it will talk to all your devices. Um, I've also been kicking around uh, looking, looking into Voyager because uh, uh, there's some, I have a couple of frustrations with Sequence Parameter Pro and I want to be able to, uh, to have more access to scripting to do, uh, to have more like monitoring scripts and catching various types of errors that sometimes happen in SGP and stuff like that. Voyager, I think, costs about the same as, as SGP. It's like 150 or 200 bucks or something. Um, so I, I have to go double. It might, it might be, I can't remember exactly the price of Voyager, but Nina is free. So yeah. <coughs> One question I saw from Beatrice yeah, uh, 
was for uh, how to use a tilt adapter. And I would love uh, to come back and answer that, Beatrice, with us showing you on the video because I need to learn it as well. So uh, that's that's on my agenda for the next episode, Beatrice. And I thank you for that question. Cool. I've never used one. Um, I yeah. Any any weird star issues are usually other stuff before I get into tilt, um, like uh, not being at the right back focus from my focal reducer and not on my Newtonian, not having a focal reducer, <laughs> which I do I have mean, one now, but I didn't, uh, other stuff like that. Yeah. I used an RC eight for about a year and everyone was like, get a tilt adapter, get a tilt adapter. Never, never had to get it. So What's RC, RCA, uh, just, uh, uh, Richie, uh, oh, oh. Richie creation. Yeah. Creation. Yeah, I had an eight inch from Orion for. Oh, eight. I thought you were saying A. I wasn't sure. Uh... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, eight inch. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's my my southern draw. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he is love from it, Louisiana, so. Well, and you know, uh, consonants are lost over over the internet, so. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Now, this is great. I mean, there is, you know, obviously this is kind of the boil the ocean forum here where we're, there's a lot of different ways we can take this. And, but but I think it's great to have this, you know, thanks a lot, Scott and Molly for sure. uh, championing this. This is, this is awesome because, you know, as we start brainstorming here and, uh, you know, taking it in bite-sized chunks, we can, we can, uh, we can improve and, and help for this whole community uh, find little tips, you know, uh, on, on how we can we can all get uh, more uh, leveraging all the tools that are out there, and uh, so I, I think those are great. Thanks a lot for the sequence yeah. generator, Plo, Nina, and uh, Sharp Cap. Right, those are the big ones that are uh, that we should look at. Yeah, and, so if uh, you're a beginner, ABT. you might look at using uh, these programs. Um, it's not gonna it's not gonna break your bank, and in some cases uh, might be free. Um, so uh, why don't uh, 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 Tyler, why don't you take note of, uh, of some of the desires of our audience here? Uh, one of them is uh, uh, Ken Noble wants us to try using the Maxitov 152 telescope imaging of Saturn and Jupiter. Okay. Okay. Um, we have um, people want to know what are the beginning steps to doing uh, quality imaging of planets and the moon. Um, um, let's see. Um, this one here, um, how you can contribute to science by doing astrophotography. And that's, that's yeah. a great topic to cover. Yes. Which Molly, I want to pick your brain on that. Um, yeah. we don't have to do it right now. Cause God, yeah. that'll, that'll be forever. You can do it on that show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, all right. So, so who is it again, Scott, oh, the 152 Matt Cass and one of the planetary beginnings. Two Matt Cass. Okay. 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 All right. Polar alignment tips and tricks. Oh, that's going to be discussed too. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, there's a suggestion for uh, going over how to use K stars or a slash echoes on, uh, which is a piece of software that does all the sequencing stuff, but it's for Mac. And because a lot of times hmm. Mac users, I can't help them out. there. So uh, if anybody uses K stars now, um, to the person who asked that question, we just had a presentation on the Astro Imaging channel mm -hmm. a few weeks ago about K stars. Mm -hmm. So you might want to go check that out. Um, I didn't even know it existed. I'm happy to hear that there is software for Mac because that's a yes. thing I hear from a lot of people who like already own Macs and don't want to buy another computer when they start mm -hmm. doing astrophotography. Sure. So um, K stars is, is one thing to look at, but we might have to have uh, have somebody come in from outside to talk about that one. It yeah, like the K stars people maybe. So yeah, yeah, I, ha I have their email now. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we should. Yeah, we should that's great. Out. It would be fun to have some. Uh, some of these people who developed the software actually come onto our show. So that'd be cool. Um, uh, somebody says a uh, question, how do you secure your gear for overnight capture? I wasn't sure if that was a, a question like to me or one of us, or if that was a, a topic of suggest, uh, suggestion. I don't know. It just says, how do you secure your gear? I, it might've been to you. It yeah, I did answer the question wrong. in the chat, but I, uh, I, I have a fenced and locked backyard. There you go. I have a shed. Uh, now, I do have to keep a very close eye on the forecasts because I don't have a, uh, a motorized shed or anything like that, which mm. I want to have at some point. Um, so I'd have to run out there and throw the covers over them sometimes. But We yeah. sell them here at Explore Scientific, Molly, in case you're wondering. What do you say? 
we sell those here at Explore Scientific. What, roll off roof observatories. <laughs> uh, we sell pulsar domes. Uh, that, that's a dome. Yeah, uh, it's a dome. Yeah, it's close to dome. I, well, so I can't have a dome because I have multiple rigs. So it'd have to be either a clamshell or a roll off. Yeah, I know a guy. I know a guy. <laughs> yeah, I've seen. I was eyeballing those Astrohaven clamshells, but Oof. I think I'm gonna have to wait until I like settle down and I'm not moving around all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, until I get one of those. <laughs> Another one is asteroid and comet hunting and then processing. So, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That video that uh, the time lapse that Ross showed the, uh, the comet, that was, that was cool. Right. I've got, I've got some photos from the comet from a couple of years ago. I just need to find them. I think I'm, I'm going to post one. That would be cool, Charles or Chuck. David Samard would like to have a step-by-step -step video to program XO2 mount. Jerry was doing it the other day, but couldn't find it anymore. Okay. Which XO's two? XO's two GT or XO's two PMC eight? I'm sure it was the PMC eight. I, I just want clarification. I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. Do both if need be. Yeah, we're dragging but... Jerry into this. This is uh, yeah. Okay. So, so step can... by step. Mm-hmm. Okay. Step by step, day by day. And Mike Wiesner said that uh, you could have his sky shed pod clamshell dome. What? Should have, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mike's going to send that. He's going to disassemble it, send it to you by UPS. Yeah, I think he says, okay. I have a sky, shot, a sky shed. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Ah, Mike, that's very generous of you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Don't stop my heart like that. Josh Kovacs says, I'll take it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's great. Okay. So I have one more show to do before I, I leave you guys. So we are actually going to snip this show off. Okay. Because uh, I can tell this could be the marathon you know, all day, all night, seven days a week, 365 days. <laughs> I don't think Facebook will let me broadcast that long. There we go. But in case, off, you know, so. uh, if, if, if the customers or the audience wants to submit more ideas, um, you can definitely either send it to me, Tyler at Explore Scientific, Explore Alliance, Explore Explore Alliance. Alliance. scientific.com. Yep. And if you guys want to come on to the show and show your stuff, okay, we can do that too. So mm -hmm. um, get, get your get your uh, astrophotography together, uh, figure out what you'd like to talk about, and um, you know, and come on to our show with our with our team here. So. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, and we're going to try to give back as much as we can to you. So, mm -hmm. all right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank all you. Right. Coming on. Great all right. And I'll be this back. I'm going to close out this program. And then I'm going to come back with uh, Microcosmos Voyages where Scott actually sacrifices himself for. Uh, <laughs> show, so. It was a huge needle. Big needle. <laughs> Giant Bloody. needle. Yeah, Bloody. that's right. Have a great weekend, everyone. All right. Take Have care. Bye-bye. Thanks.